Good evening and welcome to this very special independent edition of Good Evening Ghana. I'm sure people wanted us to talk about the budget. We will do that on Thursday. But tonight Ghana is celebrating 56 years of independence and um, we want to talk to a very important personality who happens to be in Ghana at this time. We want to discuss the concept of the black man. Um, Nkrumah said uh, on Independence Night that we're going to do this so that they will know that after all the black man is capable of managing his own affairs. That was 56 years ago. Um, does the black man and the black woman still have a role to play in global affairs? Are there any biblical truths that relate to this matter? We couldn't have had a better guest uh, than His Excellency Ben, I mean Ben Israel, who is the anointed spiritual leader of the African Hebrews, um, Israelites in Jerusalem. And uh, he's visiting Ghana at this time, and uh, we are extremely privileged to have him um, as our guest uh, tonight. Abba, as we call him, thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. So um, as part of our independence uh, special edition, we prepared um, a prelude uh, uh, for you, an, an interruption for you, a useful interruption by our friend from the university, uh, Dr. Chair Martin. So here there's one, and then we'll come back to Abba. Yes, the song says that um, let's do our best, contribute our quota to the development of Mother Ghana. After the break, um, we'll be speaking to our very special guest uh, for tonight's edition, His Excellency Ben Ami Ben Israel, the anointed spiritual leader of the African Hebrew Israelites of Jerusalem. You hear a lot more about what he has to say after the break. Welcome back to the show. And if you're just joining us, it's a special independent anniversary uh, program here on uh, Metro TV. We are having a very spiritual conversation tonight uh, connected to the independence anniversary of Ghana uh, with the spiritual leader, uh, Ben Amin Ben Israel, is the anointed um, leader, the anointed spiritual leader of the African Hebrew Israelites of Jerusalem. He's visiting with us here in Ghana at this time. And um, he graciously accepted to speak to us about the concerns that I have tonight. We want to talk about the black race and its historical uh, significance its current relevance and um, what the biblical record has to say about uh, people of African descent. Um, thank you very much for coming again, Abba. Thank it's you. a pleasure to have you here. You. Okay. We in Ghana were excited 56 years ago when <clears throat> our great leader, Kwame Nkrumah, uh, led this country to independence and he made a few declarations. Um, one of them was that uh, independence has been achieved and we are going to uh, pilot our own plane, to paraphrase, to show that after all, the black man is capable of managing his own affairs. And uh, that was a great international global event um, that saw an African country win itself of colonial authority and become independent in, in the true sense of the word. Um, the name Ghana also, which replaced Gold Coast, um, was said to be the name of an ancient African empire 
uh, called Ghana, which was located in the area around Mali right now. So there was a lot of uh, confidence about black people at that time. But fast forward 56 years on, a lot of that confidence has gone down because of the way in which the world has become. Um, now you as a, the leader, spiritual leader of the African Hebrews, um, establish what you have established in Dimona. Uh, tell me how you feel when you see the image of the black person uh, in the world right now. Well, first of all, I would like to give honor and praises to you all, the God of creation, the God of the Genesis, for giving me this blessed opportunity to be here on this program and to share this truth with our people of Ghana. Second, I would like to express my blessings and greetings to His Excellency, President John Mahama, and to all of the great people of Ghana on this, their Independence Day. And it is my prayer that it will be a high, holy, and sacred occasion for all of them. Well, I'm very, very concerned. And uh, we must now go back and reanalyze the problems. When you consider an individual that has an ailment, a sickness, a disease, when he goes into the office of a doctor, the first thing that the doctor will do is to invite him into his office and begin to inquire of his medical history. He will seek understanding of his medical history, his parents, possibly his grandparents. And the reason for that is that he needs to verify and to see if possibly something has occurred in his history that has caused him to meet this destiny. So history controls destiny. And it is obvious that in 1957, Dr. Wami Nkrumah was very, very sincere. And other men likened unto him. That was the problem. That was the problem because they really wanted to initiate and to apply an African idea in Ghana. And to apply an African idea in Africa was not in the best interest of the powers that be. It was not in the best interest of the Europeans. Subsequently, there was a cutoff point because they saw the African idea as posing a threat to their best interests. So when we look today and we wonder what has happened, we've got to go back now and to consider why is it that they see the implications, see the application of an African idea as a threat. We would consider that the development and the prosperity of Africa would be good for all men. But it is obvious that that is not the case. And it is for that reason that things have deteriorated. So Abba, you're, you're joining the chorus that is blaming somebody else for the lack of confidence of African people, for the plight of African people? No, blaming ourselves. And that has to take us back as to why. See, this isn't just uh, occurring by chance. There is something that occurred in our history, something that we've done. There is a controversy between us and God, and only we can undo it. But the continuously blaming someone else for our problem, this is all part of the plot. Because we feel that someone has done something to us, but we have caused these conditions to come upon us ourselves by our disobedience to the instructions of the Creator. We go back to the book of Genesis, since that is the origin of history. We must go back to the book of Genesis in the beginning and to then come forth. And when we go back to the book of Genesis, we find the great creation of Adam. Adam, in the book of Genesis, created in the likeness and image of God. And uh, thereafter, God breathed the breath of life into Adam. And what was the breath of life that was breathed into the nostrils of Adam or breathed into his soul? And once this was breathed into his soul, his soul was enlivened. It came alive. And I can say that what he breathed into Adam was intellect. He gave Adam a mind. And if God at that time gave Adam a mind, he gave him whose mind? He gave him his mind, but for his environment. Because we understand that no brain of man could contain the full brain of God. But he gave him his brain. And then he placed him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. In other words, to continue the re-imaging process in the image and likeness of God on this planet. But what happened thereafter, 
that Adam was disobedient. Adam was disobedient and it caused a disruption in the relationship between Adam and the Creator. That is the beginning of the black man's history, that is the beginning of the Adamic civilization, and that is the beginning, you hear us say, of the Genesis idea, the Genesis idea in the book of Genesis. Now, when we consider the mind of God, the application of the instructions of God, and the continuously imaging of man in the image of God, and we find that Adam turned aside from those instructions, and as a result of turning aside from those instructions, there was a breach in the relationship between him and the Creator, or the Adamic civilization and the Creator. And it is that history that has followed us down through the generations as we continue to get farther and farther away from the instructions of God, and we became more and more vulnerable to all of the powers that be that were around us. And instead of being the dominant force on the planet, we became the force that was dominated by all of the other forces on this planet. So that is the beginning mm -hmm. of the history of the black man in the book of Genesis. That's very interesting, Abba. But, but Adam was the first man that was made. And, and so if Adam disobeyed, then every other man potentially was in Adam that Adam disobeyed. So after that epoch and coming forward to the generations born after Adam, there were black people, then there were white people, and there were, there were different colored people. So everyone would have been in Adam. But why do you trace the Adamic disobedience uh, to the black people only? Remember, when we go to the fifth chapter, verses 1 and 2, in the book of Genesis, we find that it was not that Adam was a civilization. He said, and he called them Adam, male and female. We're talking about a civilization, not an individual. So we go back, and that is the reason why now that we advise our people to go back again to the book of Genesis and to come forth, to go back to the beginning of their history. And I must say, and, and not to offend anyone, but at that time, uh, there were no Europeans. What is so complicated, you know, is how historians and anthropologists, how they're able to inject portions of a European civilization into antiquity at that time. There were no Europeans in that arena at that time. All of the sons of Noah, all of the Adamic civilization, these were actually black people. That's also very interesting. And you, you talk about how anthropologists try to um, inculcate uh, European history into, into biblical history. Uh, so you're saying to us about that, the, up until Noah, there were no Europeans. When did the first Europeans occur? Well, certainly it was on the other side of the flood. Quite the contrary to what is usually disseminated that Noah had three sons and they were all different complexions. Well, Noah had sons and they were all the same complexion. And uh, someplace along that line, it is not for me to try to find the origins of the European. I will leave that for him to deal with that himself. But he says that, uh, that he actually uh, has come forth uh, from some other form other than man. You know, so uh, I will leave that for the European to try to identify that. I would prefer to stay close to the origins of the, of the black man. So he says that he is an evolved. Now this is his history. You know. He says that he is evolved from a lower species. And I must say now, when I say that the European, this is what he uh, gives as his history from a lower species, they've referred to as the theory of evolution. You know, that this has also been accepted by the church. You know, that evolution, that man began as some other lower form or species, and then he evolved. But the Adamic civilization, the Adamic civilization did not evolve from a lower form or lower species. The Adamic civilization was created from the dust of the earth by the hand of God. So we find two different directions. The Adamic civilization throughout our history that we've been in a state of digression, a state of demise. We went from physical immortality to Methuselah, 969 years, and down to the present state of affairs of approximately 75-year lifespan. 
Now, we're in a state where we're at our lowest state you know, on the planet since the creation. But on the other side, the theory of evolution has us believing that man is at his highest state since the creation. And all of these things, that's a fallacy, that's a lie. Why? Because in the theory of evolution, they're trying to convince us that this is progress. And all that is required of us is to continue on. But I'm saying that we have regressed and it is incumbent upon us to stop and turn around and get back to the Genesis. The prophets of old advised us to seek ye the old paths, to stop and turn around and seek ye the old paths. And we have got to get back to the Genesis. As a matter of fact, at this time, except that we go back to the origins of our history, we will remain in a state of confusion because nowhere along that path, the history that has been structured and disseminated by the Europeans is a version of history that is in his best interest. And in his best interest is to keep you and I alienated from the Creator. All of the advice that he passes on to our people, that the Europeans pass on to, and this has nothing to do with race, this is just truth as a matter of fact, that it is either political advice, democracy, economic advice, capitalism. But when is the last time that we've gotten advice about possibly just fundamental statement from the European capitals that maybe you should get closer to God? When have we heard any kind of statement coming out of European capitals that possibly that we as African people should consider our relationship to the Creator? Never have we heard or received such advice. Why? Because if we stop and turn around and consider that relationship, it is not in his best interest. He dominates politics, he dominates economics, but the spiritual portion, the Holy Spirit, he does not dominate. So subsequently, to try to guide us back to the source of our strength is not in his best interest. So at that, we now are saying unto our people, go back now to the book of Genesis. Go back and begin reading the Bible in the beginning. The Adamic civilization, this is the beginning of the history of mm -hmm. black man on this planet. So you're saying that the quagmire that the black man finds himself in, the economic difficulties, can be solved only by a spiritual reconnection with God. Exactly. That, that, that's very interesting. I'll, I'll come back to that. But let's come to the evolution theory that you talked about. And you are talking about a regression um, or a retrogression of, of man, of the Adamic civilization, that we have fallen from high and we are very low now. But evolution, the opposite one says that we have come from behind and we are up now. But to criticize your Adamic civilization and to call it a retrogression, I disagree with you because we have computers today. Uh, surely Adam and Methuselah and Noah didn't have computers. We, we're showing this television program here in Accra. It can be seen by millions of people around the world. Wherever anybody was, they want to hear what Abbas said on television last night. They can just go on the internet, type something, and they'll see you talking as if you were talking in front of them. Uh, we can speak on mobile phones today and connect with each other. We surely have had development, technical development, intellectual development, that we believe also came from the Spirit of God. Is that not real development? Is that retrogression? Well, let us look at the whole picture at the same time and to consider who's really benefiting from this form of progress. Mm -hmm. The rivers, the lakes, the oceans, the seas, the ozone, the soil, men, woman, the children, the family. So when we weigh this, when we weigh this form of progress and we put it beside what we have lost or what it has cost us, then it is obvious that we've made a bad deal. That is not to say that in the, in the development of the kingdom of God that we're going to go back to washboards or back to donkeys or camels. But it is to say that when you look at the whole picture, all of the life support system upon which our lives depend, it has been eroded right before our eyes. And we're looking at this, how we're heading down a path now that except that we stop and turn around, we're going to find out that we're going to become extinct with 
all of our technology, with our televisions and all of these things. So I'm, what I'm saying is that we've got to go back and evaluate. Have we made a bad deal? We've paid a price that far outstrips, that is far too much for what we have really gained. When we put it on the scales of life, man is sicker today, the family is more disunited today, and all of these things, the children are in disarray today, the, o the, the oceans, the rivers, the seas, the lakes, who's really profiting from this? When we see now, do you feel that the oceans are happy? With this progress, do you feel that the seas are happy from this form of progress? Do you feel that the lakes, the rivers are happy from this form of progress? So I understand, but they continue to show us this form of progress. But what I'm saying is that right beneath the dermis, you know, right beneath the skin, you will find a very cancerous sore. On the other side of the coin, we've gained all of this, but what has a man gained? If he gaineth the whole world and he loses his soul. We've lost our health. We've lost our true wealth. Now, when we consider that and we go back to the book of Genesis again, because this is where we are now in the recreation, a new beginning. Any time that man reaches a state of affairs wherein there is mass confusion, where there is mass chaos and confusion, then the prophets call for a new beginning. And in the new beginning, what begins to move over the waters? The new beginning, this will be our new beginning. The new dominion will be an African dominion for all men. But it has to find its starting point. And in the book of Genesis, what begin to move across the waters? Spirit, Technology? Spirit of the, the Lord. The spirit, that's our power. And that spirit begins to bring a whole new world into existence. And that is where we are now. We're back in the Genesis again, the Genesis idea. And now it is incumbent upon African people to understand that this new creation depends upon them. It is incumbent upon us. They're talking about politics. They're talking about economics. But you and I must, must talk about the spirit because in order for us to bring forth the new civilization, this civilization was what I refer to as the civilization of deception. The new civilization will be the civilization of truth. And then we must breathe the breath of life into Adam again and to give him new life again. And then the prophet said unto us, he placed him into the garden and gave him dominion. And what was the command unto him? He says that it is incumbent upon us to replenish the earth. So he brought everything unto Adam, and this is my point. He brought all of the animals unto Adam for him to give him names, these things, and whatever he would call them, then that would be their name. So all of this technology, all of this progress will be brought unto you and unto I in order for us then to put it, to recategorize it, to put it into its proper place, and then we will go forth in the new world order. We're not going to go back to be without automobiles, but they've made automobiles under this idea. Automobiles have become a curse. The washing machine isn't the problem, but under this idea, the washing machine has become a curse. So what I'm saying, a new application, a new use for these things. We're not going all the way back to antiquity and take away all of the modern uh, conveniences. But there has to be a new idea of application. And all of these things now be brought to you, our beloved oh, sisters. And for renaming now, placing them and recategorizing them so that they can be utilized and wherein still our civilization can sustain itself. Because the manner that they're being utilized now, we find that they're saying that we're becoming extinct. So this is what I'm saying, that I'm not knocking, you know, the materialistic gain, this, 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 a little of this progress. But what I am saying, the problem is the idea. You see, we've got to go back and realize there are laws of limitations. You cannot keep putting 30, 40, 50,000 automobiles on the roads in Ghana every year, you know, and not expect 
to be creating havoc and more problems. At some point, we've got to tell the people the truth. We've got to apply another idea, and I refer to this as an African idea for development. So that will mean that instead of a four-car family, mm -hmm. maybe there'll just be a one-car family. Everyone can't have an automobile. Everyone can't have a washing machine. You can't buy a sewing machine and just put it in the house because someone across the street has a sewing machine. So what I'm saying, what has made the automobile or the washing machine a curse, it is the idea under which it is being applied. And uh, I, I would like to just give you know, an, an example there, you know, if, I, if I may, Paul. That, yes, indeed. Uh, we take now you know, that we hear quite often now about the, the great problems you know, being faced by the overconsumption of salt. No, sodium. You know. mm -hmm. And uh, we find that sodium and salt is coming in mainly through processed goods, you know. Well, now, you and I now know that sodium is a mineral, a vital mineral. We have to have sodium. Mm -hmm. So sodium isn't the problem. No. But the problem is the idea has to be changed through which the consumption, they've made sodium, salt, the problem a curse now. And this is what I'm saying. Salt, sodium isn't a curse, but it is the idea that has made sodium a curse. So what do we have to do? We've got to now, as we bring forth new industries, there has to be a new idea. Other than that, it will remain a curse. So when we bring in the manufacturers now into Ghana, uh, when we bring in the manufacturers and the processors into Ghana, are we going to allow them to follow the same rules that they followed in Europe? Or are we going to apply a Ghanaian, an African idea for the, the application now mm -hmm. for, the, for sodium in food, in the processing? If you're just joining us um, and you're wondering um, where all that wisdom is coming from, you're listening to His Excellency Ben Amin Ben Israel. He is the anointed spiritual leader of the African Hebrews Israelites in Jerusalem, and we are celebrating 56 years of Ghana's independence. We are taking the opportunity to have a conversation with Abba, as we call him, um, to understand uh, where did the black man come from and where are we going. And Abba is saying that um, there is a new leadership for, for the world, for global affairs, that the African is, um, is being beckoned to take up. But it has to do, or it is grounded in a certain spiritual reconnection with the Creator, the God of Genesis. And that's the uh, there will be a new world, uh, a new prosperous world, to be led by the African for the benefit of all. So I'm going to ask Abba questions on that one now. Uh, so let's get back to this issue, I mean, the Africa, many African countries and, and some black uh, people outside of Africa have an economic, uh, obvious economic, um, apparently insurmountable difficulty. In Ghana, we have economic chaos. Um, we can't balance our budgets. We don't have enough food to feed, feed our people. Uh, but Africa is called a continent of paradox because there's everything here, very rich, yet we are poor and we have been attempting to apply politics, we're told that we have to have democracy, and democracy will bring us economic development. And many Ghanaians will tell you that we've been doing that for 20 years, and we, have, we are yet to see uh, that uh, tremendous economic growth that they said democracy will bring. Uh, but we are still doing it, and we are doing our best to do it. We have made some uh, successes. So there's politics, there's economics, there's judiciary, there's an organization of the state around a modern theory. And we are trying to apply that modern theory to create a certain kind of leadership that will take Africa there. Now, you are saying that all of that is not necessary. What is important is a spiritual reconnection to the God of Genesis. And everything else will follow just like that? That, that mind again. So when we go back to the God of Genesis, we go back and he breathed the breath of life into Adam. And if he gave Adam a mind... He gave Adam intellect. He gave him whose mind? His mind. So what we're saying is the application of the spirit of the idea of the mind of God in our affairs will allow us to solve all of those problems. 
all of those problems have come upon us and all of the families on, on the earth today is because of the application of an idea. We've had men, certainly we can verify and we can bear witness that we've had leaders that were sincere, very, very sincere, that would like to solve the problems. But under the present idea, you cannot solve the problems. They have not solved the problems. 1% of the population in the U.S. controls 90% of the wealth. 5% of the population in Europe controls 90% of the wealth. 50%, 50% of, the, of the wealth of the earth is owned by 10% of the earth's population. I need not say who that is. 50% of the earth is owned by 10% of the population. So what I'm saying there, economics, capitalism, is that what we're trying to do in Ghana? I mean, are we trying to find that 1% to put that kind of power into their hands? And this is why I'm saying that we've got to have a new idea. Wealth is not the problem. The distribution of wealth is the problem. All of the things that we have now, are we going to distri distribute the wealth in the manner that they're distributing the wealth in the US or in Europe? Or a new idea to be brought forth wherein we will find a different manner to distribute the wealth in the midst of our people. So what we're saying is that you cannot solve the problems you know, using the same mind that created the problems. I mean that the mind that created the problems cannot solve the problems. And the fruit that we're seeing today. The fruit. The fruit that we're the seeing. The fruit. Fruit, right. The yield. Mm -hmm. We look out today all over the world, wherever the, this idea, the Eurocentric idea is being applied, we see the same fruit. We see the same fruit, be it the U.S. Whatever country adopts and applies that idea, we will see the, the wealth, a great shift in the wealth. Wherein, in the days maybe 50, 100 years ago in Ghana, there was a more equal distribution of the wealth. But today, when we bring our people under that idea, the wealth begins to shift and falls into the hands of a few, while the masses will continue to suffer. But not just here. Then check all over the planet, and you will find the same results. If you want a different result, if we would see this, Paul, as a harvest, if we see this as a harvest today all over the world, then what are the seeds that have yielded this harvest? And if we continue to plant the same seeds, we're going to continue to realize the same harvest. And by the fruit, you will know. The fruit that we see, that is the yield of this idea all over the planet, is that what we want for Ghana? If so, continue to apply that idea. But if that is not what we want for Ghana, then we've got to plant a new seed. If we now, at this time, will plant a new seed, and this is what I'm saying, there has to be an African idea for development. And if we plant an African idea for development, it too will yield fruit. And if it is not the fruit that we desire, then plant new seeds. But it would be foolish of us to look all over the planet today the same seeds that they continue to give unto us and tell us to plant these seeds and everyone that has planted them has reaped the same harvest. And we continue to believe that you can plant oranges and someday you're going to yield apples? No, no. We have to realize the truth at this point. And that is why that my advice to Ghanaians, to African people at this time, to stop being afraid of ourselves, of our own minds. It is time now for African scholars, men and women, to sit down now and come up with an idea that will yield the fruit of our dreams, that will yield the fruit of our dreams. Wami Nkrumah had a dream, and he had an idea. Martin Luther King had a dream, and he had an idea. And that idea that Wami Nkrumah had was in fact, he wanted to sow some different seeds 
in Africa. And that became the problem. Siku Toure with the French in Guinea. He wanted to sow some new seeds, be it the DRC and Patrice Lumumba, Julius Nairi. These men wanted to play, they wanted to plant new seeds. And a new seed would bring forth a new harvest. And a new harvest would not be in the best interest of the powers that be. I'll come back after the break, Abba, and uh, we would like you to tell us a few more practical things. And I'll be asking you, for instance, that um, if the African Union were to come to you and say to you about that, show us the way. How do we go? How do we get this new breath of the Spirit of God to pour again on Adam um, and to pour again on, on, on the sea and to divide the water from, from the dry land and to create the firmament? Um, how do we get a repetition of that? Uh, so that we can form that new world that you're talking about. I'll be asking you that question. And towards the end, we'll be talking about you and your people, uh, uh, black Hebrew based in Israel. Uh, we'd like to know a little bit about, about that one as well. So after the break, um, we'll take an interlude and then Abba will, will continue speaking with us. Welcome back to this very special independent edition of Good Evening Ghana. If you have just joined us, you've missed a whole lot, but uh, we still have some time to go and we'll be getting to that critical question discussing with our very special guest about Africa and what we need to do at this stage. Um, what we are discovering on this program to be called the, the new African idea. Um, let's take another musical interlude again. Let's go to um, uh, Dr. Chamati of the University of Ghana to give us another musical interlude and then we'll come back to this conversation. <laughs> Ya 
Welcome back, and I hope you enjoyed that um, interlude. And thank you, Abba, for staying uh, with us. Um, let's now talk about um, the question I asked before the break. If you were called today by the African Union and they say that we hear that you have a great solution for uh, underdevelopment, what is the idea? Tell us, what should we do? What are the practical steps, practical first five steps that we should take as a people to get back onto better ways? Well, number one, I would ask them to refocus once again upon the value of African culture and uh, by way of African culture, we will find that there are many facets of African culture that remain very, very closely relati related to the instructions given by God you know, in the days of our fathers. And that becomes part of the problem. We must restore value again, an African value. Today, we've let the value of everything that we have slip out of our hands. We must now repossess, repossess our valuable culture. We must cease to be afraid to think as Africans. We must cease to be afraid to think as Africans. And I'm saying that to say, if I may give, again, uh, one of the points would be dealing with poverty. You know, how do we resolve the problems of poverty throughout Africa? The first thing that we must do I would inquire, I would ask them to consider the point of reference when you're talking about poverty in Africa. I was speaking to a young Ghanaian, and he was earning $100 a month, $100 a month. And uh, he was taking care of his family of four, assisting his extended family, and had the community helping him to build a home block by block on $100 a month. And then I was speaking to an American earning $22,000 a year with a family of four, and they were in abject poverty, you know, that they were homeless, $22,000 a year. Who is it that is defining poverty in Africa? The reason why we have not been able to solve the problem of poverty in Africa is because we have no African point of reference. I definitely, now $22,000 is a long ways from $1,200 a year, but this individual is, is a middle class Ghanaian. I mean, with $100 a money, all that he's able to accomplish. But these figures continue to deceive us. So what I'm saying is that once we evaluate poverty from an African idea, and then we apply that idea, we will find the AU, we will eradicate all of poverty in Africa within seven years. And that's an absolute. Why? The reason why we cannot <coughs> resolve Sorry. poverty at this time is that we really don't know what poverty in Africa is. <coughs> Are we to wait until an African now, a Ghanaian is making $22,000 a year and following this idea, and we're looking up and saying, oh, he's homeless, you know, I mean that he's, <coughs> he's in poverty. So what I'm saying, is that we've got to go back now. A new idea. And uh, what is poverty? The members, needless to say, bring together the economists. Uh, well, poverty, by, by the UN standard, people who live below a dollar a day, that's poverty. And, but poverty, but it's being controlled by the mindset of Europeans. Okay, the dollar a day. So this individual is earning approximately uh, $4 a day. $4 a day he's earning, and he's a middle class. Okay, is that our objective now? Our objective then to resolve poverty in Africa would be to bring all Ghanaians up to a salary of 3 or $4 a day. But once we bring them up to that standard of 3 or $4 a day, that will not be suitable for the European standard. Why? because we've got to become great consumers. And there are certain things that they want us to consume. 
But now with that idea of three or four dollars a day has to come an idea. Other than that, you're still going to be in poverty. An idea about consumption, an idea about materialism, an idea about family. Because if we are earning three or four dollars a day and we're trying to live according to the European standard, we're still going to be dissatisfied. So this is what I'm saying, that with the new mindset, restoring the African mindset, taking a look and putting a value upon contentment, what we have as a people, I've found more individuals in the interior, in the villages of Africa, that are content, that are content with their lifestyles. And, say, and this is not to say that there are not some things that need to be corrected you know, in the midst of our people. But what I am saying is, what is the value of that contentment? And when you go into the cities in the countryside of America, you know, in the European countries under that idea, and you find nothing but discontentment. So all that I'm saying, if we bring them up to that standard of $4 a day, and we continue to use that example, and we don't give them a new idea, what night is still going to be classified as poverty. Mm. So That's interesting. So you're saying that the poverty is a question of the mind. And, and the way in which it has been defined. Exactly. And that we can begin to look at it another way. Exactly. And if we do that, you, you reckon that in seven years we will eradicate poverty from, from Africa? Not, not just reckon. With the AU following a different idea mm -hmm. for development, you know, and restoring value. Today, the African diet has been trounced upon. You know, the, the African, diet, the food. The food, right. Mm -hmm. We find the indigenous plants of Africa very, very healthy grains, they've been cast aside. And today there is a preference, you know, in many countries for GMOs. So what I'm saying- Genetically modified foods. Right. You think that, that's, that's wrong? Absolutely. The GMOs? Absolutely, well, if I would say that- well, Ghana signed onto it last yeah. year or last two years? Well, let me, let me pose a question back uh, to whomever signed on, that you've heard the term on many occasions, you are what you eat. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Can you eat genetically modified food without your genetics being modified? Can't you understand? It, it, will, it will affect your genetics. Ex exactly. Mm -hmm. That is the plan. That is the plan. This is a methodical plan that is unfolding. We have every, tell me, what do we need GMOs for here in, in, in Ghana or in Africa? We've got everything, but it's part of a methodical plan that is unfolding to continue to modify. And with that genetic modification, it is affecting a brain. It is affecting the minds of our people. So what I'm saying, the mindset, an African mindset, that young man that I was speaking to that was earning $100 a month, he was perfectly happy. He was happy and he felt very, very wealthy. And he was making approximately $4 a day because he had an African mindset. He had an African community helping him to build his house. He had the extended family, you know, there around him to comfort him, you know, to relieve the stress from upon him. So what I'm saying that we can call, we can bring the minimum salary up to $10 a day, $20 a day, except that we bring a new idea, we will never resolve poverty because the poverty level will just continue to fluctuate. We will never solve the problem. What I'm saying that the problem is solvable. We must go back now to restore an African value upon the things that we have you know, in the midst of us. And when we restore that African value, then the $4 a day will become sufficient. Why? Because once we understand the value of contentment, the value of being in our lands, of having our extended family, having the community, once that takes on value, then the $4 will make us feel like we're, we're multimillionaires. Hmm. Very interesting thoughts from you, Abba, and, uh, and, and, and quite controversial too. Uh, but when you look at what is happening now, based on what you have said, do you have hope for this, for this people of God? Mm -hmm. Do you have hope? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, Paul, we are now, and uh, I take this opportunity to, to say this, that Ghana has been chosen. Ghana has been chosen? Ghana has been chosen by, by God. By God? Ghana has been chosen by God to lift up the light of restoration of African glory for all of the African nations. Ghana has been chosen by God to lift up that light of restoration for all of the African nations. 
You know, so How do you know that, Abba? I know that because the revel that I've come down from Jerusalem to bring a message unto our people here in Ghana, that Ghana has been chosen. Remember that Wami Nkrumah, in the beginning you know, of his ministry, he was called Osajifu. Yes. And Osajifu means what? It means Messiah or deliverer. Mm, deliverer. That means that he had an idea, a spiritual idea. He had a spiritual idea that he wanted to apply. And this is where we are at this time. Ghana is the country that has been chosen. First country to achieve independence, and now for a greater level of independence. Ghana now will have to take her place. And I know that uh, putting this, this, this chore, you know, this upon, upon Ghanaians at this time, will be hard to accept. But at some point, at some point, you know, that a message will come from Jerusalem to African people, to Ghanaian people, you know, says, and the law shall go forth from Zion, and the word of God from Jerusalem. So, and this is where we are now. The hope, absolutely, because I feel that Ghanaians will rise to the challenge. And uh, what that means is that we're going to have to modify our lifestyles, that we're going to have to go back now and seek truth. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But the ruler at that time, Pontius Pilate, you know, in Jerusalem, Pontius Pilate posed the question, he said, what is truth? You know, yet he thought that truth was something you could go out and buy like a commodity. But when Yeshua said, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What is this truth that he was referred to that had the only power, because he referred to, as it, to a freedom? Have we achieved the freedom that will be brought to us that he was referring to that we could attain by way of truth. Absolutely not. In the 61st chapter of Isaiah, we find that Yah has anointed, you know, an anointed personage, he said, to bring good tidings unto the meek, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim, cap to pro to proclaim liberty to the captives. So now we're talking about another freedom. But right today, you know, the brokenhearted, has their hearts been bound up? You know, liberty to the captives, you know, that all of these things have not been achieved. Why? You know, because the freedom that has been promised by the prophets cannot be given to us by way of a political system. The freedom that has been promised by the prophets can only come unto us as we once again come under Allah ourselves to be governed by truth. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What is truth? Pontius Pilate posed the question. We go back to the Genesis. Back to the Genesis. And if just for, for an example, you know, I recall that you know, in the Genesis, when did the new day begin? Our people have been so new long, day. our people have been so long away from the Genesis, and so many things have them confused you know, today. When did the new day begin in the Genesis? You know, the day did not begin in the Genesis, you know, at midnight. It begins when the sun rose. It began, no, it began when the sun set. When and the, sun the set. evening and the morning was yeah. the first day. Mm -hmm. So how did we begin celebrating and keeping a day that it says that midnight, midnight is what? The middle of the night. Yes. And now we're celebrating that as the new day. And I'm simply saying that we will go back now and to put everything into the perspective that God had it in the Genesis. So there are some things, truth. When we go back now and we consider truth, what is the, the, what is the, the, the day, you know, as it was ordained by God, as it was ordained by God? So what is the significance of that? What is the significance of that? So mm -hmm. I recall the words of Yeshua saying that, when the apostles were inquiring of him about certain things that he was able to do and they were not able to do. And he said, this type of wisdom mm. cannot go forth except by prayer and fasting. And fasting. Mm. So then, if you start your day, you know, of fasting from midnight to midnight, now, then you must understand that that fast day is not in harmony. You will not receive the blessings of the Creator with that fast day. So why is these things important for us? Because we fast, we pray. 
The prophet says that we must pray three times a day. And we look in the book of Psalms and David says that the prayers were evening, evening, morning, and afternoon. Not morning, noon, and night. So I'm saying that to say that there is hope. There are some things. We've got to go back and face the truth now. And in order to do what is required of us, we've got to go back to the Genesis again and then come forth according to the order that was given unto us by God in the beginning. Abba, thank you very much. Thank you so very much for talking to us. Uh, may the God of Genesis be with you, and we hope that we'll see you again. And by the time we see you the next time, a lot of improvement will have happened to the black man. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Abba. You. Thank you, viewers, for watching. A very happy independence anniversary to you. They say Ghana, be a year to wit. Ghana will be well. Bye-bye.